you. Uh, I was able to provide information, which did cause a stir. And uh, I've received numerous emails and requests for videos and a general consensus that for many people, they say for the first time, the biblical story of Jesus and the sacrifice and our salvation has made sense. Now, I'm going to show or share some emails with you, but first, I just wanted to go over with you and kind of slowly, because I can get an idea by looking at you. If you can understand this here, then I feel fairly comfortable, you know, when it goes on the TV. But if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, and, and I didn't make this stuff up. I don't know what they're talking about either. I mean, this stuff that I received from scientists and, and put it together with the Bible stuff. It's very, very important that you understand this. Let me, give you, let me just give you a basic idea of later what's coming. Here you are sitting in a chair, and you're looking at me. And you think you're there and I'm here, which is a reasonable thing. And if we're 15 or 20 feet apart. And here I am standing here looking at you, and I think I'm here and you're there. Okay? Well, this may come as a shock, but you're looking at me and I am not where you think I am. Now, if you take your two hands and go right here to the back of your head, there's a little box right there. Okay? That's where I am right now. I am not in front of you. I am in the little room with you back here. And you are not in front of me. You are all in the little room back here. That sounds bizarre. Well, if you think that sounds bizarre, how about if I tell you there is no such thing in the universe as color? It's an illusion. Everything is black and white. And all of the coloring goes on by the little color makers that operate the tubes from here back to the little room. And when it gets to the little room, there's color. All frequencies and wavelengths are measured, and that's what comes out as color. There is no color outside of you. All of it is inside of you. It's all illusion. And before you crawl under your desks to scream some enchanted thing that the guy has gone completely berserk, let me tell you that I will share with you from the finest physicians and scientists in the world that what I am telling you is an absolute fact. So this whole time of your life, you've gone around not having a clue who you are, what you are, or how you work. And so keep that in mind. Right this very minute, I am not in front of you up here. I am back here in the little room with you. And you should clean up your room a bit. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> Isn't that weird and bizarre and berserk stuff? But you know what? It's absolutely 1,000% true. Now, starting off with that, I had one person who um, wrote me that I must be crazy calling God and Jesus photons. Well, number one, as I told this person, most people, including you, him, do not know what a photon is. And number two, I didn't call God and Jesus a photon. The Bible did. So let's clarify this because of its importance. Bill Donahue, standing behind you in your little room, <laughs> has called God a photon. Does the Bible support that? And, and, and it's very important for me to make sure that nothing that goes on that board 
is deceiving or is my feelings or what I think or anything like that. We have to be sure. Now, you would say, well, the Bible was written so long ago, how would they know God's a photon and nobody even knew? The Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible were written in Alexandria, Egypt, under the direction of the Greek Ptolemies, who reported to Alexander the Great. They incorporated into the Bible the works of classic Greek minds that actually set the foundation for civilizations move into the realm of philosophy and science. That's where it came from. The first information about the atom came from uh, a guy by the name of Democritus, who lived about 460 BC in, in Greece. If he, if he existed at all, God only knows, because I still try to figure out who in the heck taught him about atoms in 460 BC. But this is uh, the story of Democritus, and it's right here. And as it says on the screen, and that's the picture of him, it looks a little bit like Santa Claus, but it, it's not. It, Around 460, Greek uh, philosopher Democritus developed the idea of atoms. Now, you see, just use a little common sense. He developed the idea of atoms. The Greek mythologist created the Bible. And the first person in the Bible was named Adam. And in order to create the woman, an ionic bond of splitting the atom was carried out on Adam, Adam. He asked this question. If you break a piece of matter in half and then break it in half again, how many breaks will you have to make before you can break it no further? Democritus thought that it ended at some point, a smallest possible bit of matter. And he called these basic matter particles atoms. So when you try to figure out how it is possible that things in the Bible uh, could reflect scientific values from so long ago, over 2,500 years ago. Remember that he was speaking this stuff 150 years before the Bible was written in Alexandria. So that's how science covered in mythology symbols. And that's how they found their way into the scriptures, the Bible. So we have the first discussion of uh, atoms presented by the Greek Democritus in 460 BC. And that will show you, and it should show you, why the first man, Adam, was the first man, Eve, are actually atoms developed through nuclear fission as an ionic bond. You know, removing a rib from Adam to make Eve, removing an electron from Adam to make a positive uh, ion. So you have a, a negative ion, rather. You have positive ion, negative ion, an ionic bond. You split the atom. Now, when we consider light, photon, and the Bible, saying God is light is not difficult you know, to see where that came from. And so then uh, we go and we look at this guy named Lucretius, who was another guy from that period of time. Lucretius wrote in on the nature of the universe in 55 BC. The light and heat of the sun, these are composed of minute atoms, which when they are shoved off, lose no time in shooting right across the inner space of air in the direction imparted by the shove. How do these people know this stuff? Euclid had made a mathematical study of light. He wrote Optica in about 300 BC, in which he studied the properties of light which he postulated traveled in straight lines. He described the laws of reflection and studied them mathematically. Okay. These are the people whose minds were picked for the information that was going into the Bible. In about 60 AD, Heron made the interesting observation that when light is reflected by a mirror, it travels along the path of least length. Ptolemy, about 80 years after Heron studied light in his astronomical work, through accurate measurements of positions of stars, he realized that light is refracted by the atmosphere. Reaching again for common sense, 
finding where the Bible was written, finding the influences that came to the text of the Bible, uh, understanding how it was incorporated into mythology, and utilizing the Greek understanding of science, we found the story of Adam and Eve, the first story in the Bible, actually being the story of nuclear fission. But nobody ever told you that. They said a lady was talking with a snake. And the snake said, go ahead and eat the apple. And you wonder why everything is screwed up. This is as far as we've gotten. A lady ate an apple after talking to a snake. OK? And yet here are these guys talking about atoms and nuclear fission and ionic bonding. And as far as we ever got with it was the snake screwed up the whole thing. And then we saw God being described as light. Now, people will say, Bill Donahue calls God and Jesus a photon. No, he didn't. The Bible did. This is what the Bible says. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man. 1 John 1, 5, this then is the message we've heard of him. Declare to you, God is light, and in him is no darkness. So can you figure this out? You have the Greek writers of the Bible taking from the minds of classic Greeks in science who wrote about atoms and light 500 years B.C. And the Bible turns up identifying what we call today God as light. Remember the word God is the word good with a no missing. The word devil is the word evil with a D on the front of it. You know, so it's all a sham. Okay, It's all nonsense. What it says here is that this entity you call God is not a human being. That means no legs, no arms, no head, no nose, no eyes, and no the rest of the stuff either. Nothing. Not a human being, but light. Now, if you're going to be influenced by minds such as Democrates and Lucretius, etc., you're going to show Atom and Eve as nuclear fission and God as light. And that is exactly what we have. We have Jesus identified as the light. We have Jesus identified as the Son of God who is identified as light, the Son of Light. We are created in God's image and likeness, meaning we are all light. And when the Bible says God is not a man, God is light, there is only one thing then that God could possibly be, which is photon, an intelligent light messenger particle. There is no other possibility. Oh, what do you mean there's no other possibility? Do you know everything about the entire universe? No, but I do know what makes human beings work, and it's electricity and it's photons. So there is no other possibility. Once you understand that God is a photon, Jesus is a photon, and you are a photon, then the entire story of Jesus coming to Earth to sacrifice himself for us, to make us one with God, suddenly, suddenly becomes an absolute fact. And this is where we concluded last time. And, and this is what has brought on so much interest from around the world, literally. I mean, really. OK, you're right. now let's uh, everybody pay atten attention. Let's, uh, the Bible story said that Jesus had to come to the earth and die so that we could become one with God. Now, I always had a lot of problems with that, but that's what it said. Now, if God is a photon, and Jesus is a photon, and we are photons, then suddenly that story is very logical and very understandable. So let's go to the basis of the Bible statement <coughs> that God is light, photon. And in the quantum realm, this would happen, OK? In the quantum, and this is in the real realm, not in the religious realm, OK? When two photons are entangled, they are one, OK? So here we go to explain it again. And for Bible references, we're going to identify the photons as we saw them last week in the laboratory for teleportation. You have photon A, you have photon B, and you have photon C. All right. And now let's see if we can uh, make some uh, sense out of this. Photon A, photon B, and photon C. OK, 
Here is photon A. There she is. That's you and me. Sucking our thumb and wondering what the hell is going on. There she is. Photon A. Okay? Here is photon B. Okay, that's our hero. Jesus, he's photon B. And here's the big kahuna, photon C, who is God. All right? Now, this is, this is the way this operates. And we're, we've gone into the subatomic. We've gone into the quantum realm. And we're going to see this. All right. Now, we have photon A, photon B, and photon C. All right? You want to hit the next one? And here is a little statement that comes on. And it says, you have three photons, A, B, and C. You, Jesus, and God. All right? And that's easy uh, to understand. Now, let's take it uh, to, the next, to the next one. Yeah? The researchers, now I'm reading from the quantum study, uh, the, the, the studio. The researchers created B and C as entangled photons. And what does that mean? It means that C, God, and B, Jesus, are entangled. They're one. Okay? And what does the scripture say? The scripture says, John 10.30, I and my Father are one. Absolutely. It's a scientific fact. Photon C and photon B are entangled photons. Okay? They become one. And so, uh, what we're saying here, the scripture confirms, and you never, you never understood that before, did you? You never understood how God and Jesus could become one, except now you see it because photon B, which we've identified as Jesus, and photon C are entangled, and so they are one. And here, where Jesus is entangled with photon C, the two photons are entangled. The Bible has him saying, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Of course, because we're talking about photon C. But now, they're entangled, and that's wonderful. Isn't it wonderful? Jesus and God are entangled. They're one. But look at this poor lady over here. She's sucking her thumb. She doesn't know what the heck to do. She's left out in the cold. Something has to be done. So the idea is we have to bring A into the mix, don't we? We have to get A saved so A can be part of the Jesus God thing. In other words, A has got to somehow get together with B and C. There's only one way to do it, and we'll show you how what they did. The researchers entangled B, Jesus, same here, with A. That's the way it has to be. The second step destroyed A. But then Jesus, who is B, took on the characteristics of A. And here then, A can say, as the Bible says, it is no longer I who live, but the Christ who lives within me. How come? Because the goal is to get A into a, a oneness with C, God. But the only way you can do that, listen very carefully, the only way you can do that is by sacrificing A. A comes, gives its life, and takes on the characteristics of this life. Jesus becomes, takes on the characteristic A, okay? so Jesus no longer exists in the form of Jesus, but now has become one with A. And then we see the scripture, which now can be said by this lady, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How could that be? Because B, Christ, came in and took over the characteristics of A, you and me, so that you and me then could become one with C, God. So that's what happened. Jesus becomes us by this particular sacrifice. Now let's see where we go from there. Okay? Here, the change of C, uh, B, Jesus taking over and becoming us meant 
that C, God, had to change polarization to remain the opposite of B. Easy. C, God, had to do something to change so that he could remain entangled with B. He had to change, though, because B no longer had the Jesus characteristics. B now had our characteristics. So C's polarization ended up the same as A, meaning A, you and me, become one with God, and here she is. <laughs> Everything is well in the neighborhood. Okay? God and Jesus are entangled, but they've got to get you and me into the mix. In order to do that under quantum law, Jesus has to be sacrificed, gives up his life, so that he then takes on our life, and instantly we become one with God. And that's your story. And that's what way it works, and that's, that's it. The sacrifice of Jesus be takes upon itself the characteristics of you and me, and we become one with God. Now you see, when you look at this, you, you, something you have to understand. There was no God involved in this. There's no Jesus involved in this. These are photons, A, B, and C. But this is the way it works. There is nobody named Jesus in the sky. There's nobody by the name of God in the sky. And there's nobody by the name of you in the sky. These are photons. But nature said, hey, photon A, all the photons sitting in there, we got to get them over here in unity with photon C. So we're going to have to send photon B. And when photon B gets there, photon B is going to wind up crashing and taking on the life of photon A. And that way A can get together with C. Do you understand that? Is that, will that be too difficult for people to understand? Tell me, I mean, do you understand or do you have a question about it? No. It makes better sense. All right. I, I know that's an awfully difficult thing to, to do because I know many times I went to meetings when I was in, in a job and they said, does everybody understand this? I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but I didn't want to say, oh, I don't understand. You know? When you say polarization, you're always talking about opposite. Mm -hmm. Jesus and God are polarized. They are one, but they're opposite. One is the supreme God. The other is the human characteristic. And, the opposites join together that we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it has to work that way. And it does work that way. And that's what brings us to the meditation part, which is so important, because as soon as we stimulate the electrons in the pineal, then we absorb that photon B, or the Jesus photon, which we call it, which then starts this whole process into motion. So for you Christians out there who may be spinning in your pews, I am in no way diminishing the sacrifice of Jesus to make us one with God. I am simply explaining it so that there is no doubt that it happened. I'm explaining how God and Jesus are one, and how we become one with God through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's how I explained it. I proved it. Who else ever proved it? Oh, I proved it. So I know no one ever explained this before, but you got to lighten up. Jesus told me to do it. <laughs> now, I want to share with you... Um, the information that has stimulated many people from around the world to contact me. I've received some very positive and encouraging emails, and I thought I'd show you a few. Here's one from Carol in Georgia, and she says, Bill, I'm simply amazed. I believe I understand it well enough to be thoroughly awed. My heart jumps a leap. I am absolutely blown away. I've been meditating most every day. That's good. And that's very nice, and that's very good. Here's one uh, that's a little, uh, little different. And the guy says, uh, I love you, man. <laughs> I got your newsletter already. You have helped me, helped many understand further, and I thank you for my ionic bond heart. That's from the cloud jumper in Florida. 
<laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, that was good. And here's one from San Francisco, from Phyllis in San Francisco. Thank you, Bill, for exquisitely casting light, pun intended, upon what can only be acknowledged as our true identity. With deep gratitude, Phyllis from San Francisco. And then we have John in California. And very short and to the point, he says, man, that's good stuff. I get giddy when it rings true inside like that. John in California. And uh, this is from Nikki. I don't know where Nikki's from, but Nikki says, I'd definitely like to learn more about this, but I wanted to let you know that what you wrote makes way more sense to me than just saying that a guy died and now we're all okay. <laughs> well, you can get right to the point, you know, and it's really looking at the Bible as symbolic truth rather than a word for word truth would save a lot of people a lot of headaches, <laughs> which is good. Here's one from West Africa. The name, guy's name is Kenny, and, and this, this uh, touched me, and I, I want to share it with you. Kenny said, Sir, I am Kenny by name from Nigeria in West Africa. I have nothing much to say here than praising you for the wealth of your knowledge. I thank you also for all your efforts in airing these articles free without financial demand. May you live long for us. I look forward to receiving from you soon as you receive and read my mail. I can't wait any longer. I want to grow in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding and believing every possibility of my pursuit to be achieved. Your help, words, advice, guide in this regard is highly appre appreciating to be appreciated. You are a man of wisdom is the little statement I can make for now since I don't know anything else better to say. Okay. And that, uh, that was very, very nice. And uh, let's see what the next one is, John. I, I don't, it's not coming up. Oh, here, this is a good one. You're, Bill, you're like a rock star to me. Feel your work is inspired. Peace and blessings. I'm a rock star. So, you know, uh, and we got that. And then we go on, and uh, this isn't coming up that quick, but let's see what we got. Uh, here's another one. I just wanted to say thank you for the work you do. This makes perfect sense. I couldn't help but think of the Bible's Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I also wanted to say that when I was very young, I remember my mother telling me about a dream she had. She described seeing what she called atoms, for lack of anything better, behaving exactly the way you described them here. She said she didn't understand why she saw it, but she knew it was important. And all these years later, thanks to you, I think I understand what she saw. And that's from Marie, and, and, and that's, that's very nice to her. You know, believe me, like, like anyone else, I really feel good when people say nice things, and I've got a lot more of these. But to be perfectly honest, the real chance to get the message out is when I receive negative mail from Christians. Um, they call me names, but they also, also ask questions that really give me an opportunity to explain to them the reasoning behind this that, you know, doesn't exist in religion. So uh, let's go and we'll try to uh, answer. And as you see, my born again friend starts off with a little bit rough. You are a delusional dolt, sir. <laughs> hey. Sadly, you have been blinded by your enormous genius and you cannot see the truth. The Bible is not intended to be dissected like a frog so as to figure out how it works or understand the meaning of life. The belief in God is based on faith. If that is too hard for you, then you may be unreachable. Not everyone will inherit the kingdom of God, but everyone will hear his message before Christ's return. I will pray for your heart to be softened and your ears to be opened. So, you know, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, you can't... Uh, you, you, I, I wrote the guy back, and I said, you know, it's not very Christian-like to call me a dolt and a dope. And I, that's, Jesus wouldn't say that. So, uh, anyhow, this is what the, his answer was. He said, my apology for making you think I was calling you a name. Now, now this is how he s explains it. But to put this petty argument to rest, Webster's Dictionary defines the word adult as a stupid person. <laughs> I truly believe you are delusional. 
And I know Jesus would not call someone a stupid person, but you are simply being one. <laughs> Uh, I am sorry, but if I am speeding through a school zone and believing it's okay to do so, I am being a stupid person. So I answered, I said, I really do not think that speeding through a school zone and differing on the inner interpretation of ancient scriptures have anything in common. I simply interpret scripture differently than has been accepted traditionally. And from the looks of planet Earth, it's obvious that Christians have interpreted incorrectly. And I wrote that. And of course, you know, and we had to kind of keep it going. And we did. <laughs> so he said, now as Christians, we are to strive to be Christ-like. Not perfect, not martyrs, but loving, forgiving, and patient. You've read the Bible. You know the fruits of the Spirit. And I wrote back and I says, as Christians, you are to strive to obey Jesus Christ and to do what he says to do. That is the only way one can be a Christian. Jesus said this, and it is perfectly clear, and I believe every word of it. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus asks, Why do you call me Lord and not do the things I tell you to do? Hebrews 5, 9 says he becomes the author of salvation to all those that obey him. You may be a social Christian and obey a church or a religious group, but you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you obey him. And that is exactly what I do. I do what he says to do, not what some church says to do. And he goes on, and, it, <laughs> and he said, you don't want to believe the stories in the Bible. Okay, you don't have to, which is good. <laughs> but I said, I believe all the Bible stories, but not literally. Just like the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, it says, be not a minister of the letter. In other words, do not take these writings literally. And I don't. And the same author described the story of Abraham and Sarah as allegory, which means it never happened. And I believe that. So he came back and uh, he said, but in reference to your opening where you call God and Jesus photons, sorry, dude, but that is so ridiculous that I had to, what does that mean? Roll on the floor laughing my ass off. Okay. <laughs> because that might as well be Scientology you were spouting. I said, there's no Scientology involved. That is exactly what the Bible says. Numbers 23 says God's not a man. That means God is not a human being. First John, God is light. If God is not human and God is light, then God is photon. God created the human body that it works off of electricity, and the only way an external source can communicate with the body is via photon and electron. That is the way God created it. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. And so I thought that that would certainly put an end to that, but now he came back to him. I have to wonder if you've overlooked or just don't believe the part that says God made man in his own image. And I said God made man in his own image as photon. You are made in the image of your mother and father. The part of you that operates your body is photon. It is the light that enters the fetus on the 49th day. The Bible saying God is not human, God is light, means that God being photon created you and his image is photon. Your body is a car that you drive, but the you that drives it is photon. Photon is simply a word that means a messenger of light, but it is real. The only entity in the world that can operate your body electrically is photon, and that is what you are, and that is how you are made in the image and likeness of God. But I mean, you can re you can really get into it, you know, with with people like this, Be and uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. But you know, he said this. <laughs> I am left to believe that God is in. I get this is a good one. I am left to believe that God is in fact a two-legged, two-armed being with a head containing two eyes, one nose, one mouth, teeth, two ears and hair, a torso, a waist, a butt, two feet, two hands, 20 combined fingers and toes. You may wish to believe that was just more of a fairy tale, but here's the thing. I said, well, the Bible disagrees with you, and just as Jesus disagrees with you. The Bible says in Numbers, God's not a man, not human. Jesus says God is spirit, and anyone who approaches him must do so in spirit. It means God is photon. And number 23, God is not a man, God is spirit, which means God's photon. So you may believe what you want, but you certainly do not believe the Bible. <laughs> All right, I thought that was a pretty rough one, and I think he'll probably back down now. But he didn't. He came back. And he said an episode of Futurama portrayed a supreme godlike being in outer space as being just a big bunch of light. 
<laughs> kind of like a small solar system or nebula. And forgive me, but I would like to go with Moses and the Disciples version over my favorite cartoonist, albeit possibly delusional, Matt Groney. That big bunch of light, I said, is actually the reality of existence outside the physical body. Photon is intelligent, creative, and eternal. Only bodies die. Photon cannot die. As humans, we can only experience 10% of all matter, and thus we think we know, but we really do not know. Life outside of the body is photon. Life inside your body is photon. If you were not photon, then your body could not work. Who would operate it? God is not a man, says the Bible. God is light, which means God is photon. And I don't know if that ended him or not. Uh, well, I can't get this one going, so let's try and see if it ended him. No, he's back. To summarize and repost the question, what is your opinion of Genesis 127? God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him male and female created him. Well, we're back to the same thing. God's image is photon. He took the atom. He removed the electron. He placed that electron into another atom. He created an ion bond, and an ionic bond. Genesis is telling us all life began with the splitting of the atom. If God is not human, if God is spirit, blah, 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 if God is lighted, then God created us in the image. You will leave the body in the ground, but the eternal image of God, which is photon, is yours forever. And I think that was pretty much, no, it isn't. He was a, come on. He, okay. Also, I am worried about your translation of the Bible in one regard in particular. I am no Bible scholar, not even sure if I'm supposed to capitalize it or not. <laughs> That's, no, I don't want to do that. I was, only, I was raised in an Assembly of God church, and I have had many, my share of skepticism. But one thing I've never been skeptical of is his word. Why should I be? What do I have to gain by trying to disprove it? So my worry comes from here. In all my years, only 31 of them, I have never taken from the Bible anything that suggests self-salvation, or as you put it, find the power within yourself. And then I replied, that, that is not my direction. It is Jesus' direction. Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. Mark, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom. Luke eleven fifty two, 52, you take away the key because you don't enter within yourself. I didn't say these things. The Bible said them. Well, it goes on and on. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, I, there's a few others like that. But as I said, the overwhelming majority of the emails were positive. But everyone does deserve an answer even those who are negative, because they take the time to write. And they do stir me up, and they do stir my mind up. And, and you'd be surprised how many other things you can develop out of someone who questions you like that. But the message of Photon has drawn more interest in hidden meanings than I've had in a long, long time. Now, I want to tell you something. And, um, you, know, it, you know, with me, you don't believe anything, but I'm just telling you anyhow. I will be taking you by the hand down a very narrow hallway into a point of understanding contained where I spoke to you about before within a small room located in the back of your head. You have a small room in your head that is the command center for all of your experience, past, present, and infinity. And we will have that explained to us in detail. It is very important because it's where everything is. But before we ascend to that plane, there are a few items on the physical three-dimensional plane to deal with. Of course, Week after week, I've shared with you about December 21st, 2012, and Paco Vuitton, and that the great shaking would culminate on December the 21st, 2012. And what did he say? He said, we would lose our interdependence on nature and our respect and understanding of nature, and trouble was going to come our way. With that, I wanted to share with you a few minutes about this swine flu thing. Uh, 
I want to provide you with a news article. And, and when you, when you, when I was thinking back on Paco of old time, saying these people are going to become so industrialized, so consumed with money and, and all of this stuff that they're going to hurt and offend nature, and it's going to hurt them back. Do you know that now on the radio they're not allowed to call it swine flu? They have to call it H151 because they're afraid people might stop eating pork chops. I mean, this comes from David Kirby, who is a journalist, and it was posted April the 25th. And look at, look at his uh, headline, Swine Flu Outbreak, Nature Biting Back and Industrial Animal Production. What does he say? Officials from the CDC and the USDA will likely arrive in Mexico soon to help investigate the deadly new influenza virus that managed to jump from pigs to people in a previously unseen mutated form that can readily spread among humans. One of the first things they will want to look at are the hundreds of industrial scale hog facilities that have sprung up around Mexico in recent years and the thousands of people employed inside the crowded, pathogen-filled confinement buildings and processing plants. John. Industry calls these massive compounds confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, though most people know them simply as factory farms. Long white buildings lined up in tightly packed rows of three, four, or more. Within each confinement, thousands of pigs are restricted to indoor pens and grain fed for market, while breeding sows are kept in small metal crates where they spend most of their lives pregnant or nursing piglets. In the last several years, the United States hog conglomerates have opened giant swine cafos south of the border, including dozens around Mexico City and the neighboring states of Mexico and Puebla. You know the interesting point about this? These are not Mexican places. These are American places. You know, they had to go south because if they stayed here, they might have to pay $10 an hour. And they go down there and they can pay 75 cents an hour. And that's exactly what Paco Votan was talking about. Smithfield Foods reportedly operates, you ought to write that word down there and stay away from it, reportedly operates a huge swine facility in the state of Veracruz where the current outbreak may have originated. Many of these CAFOs raise tens of thousands of pigs at a time. Cheaper labor costs and a desire to enter the Latin American market are drawing more industrialized agriculture to Mexico all the time, wiping out smaller traditional farms, which now account for only a small portion of the swine production. For years, leading scientists around the world have worried that large-scale indoor swine factories would become breeding grounds for new pathogens that could more easily infect humans and then spread out rapidly in the general population, threatening to become a global pandemic. Dr. Selbergild thinks the genetic swimming pool that is found in modern swine or poultry production is probably the place from whence this killer bug evolved. So you see, this isn't the first time that this has happened. They had a similar problem back in 1918. So people had an opportunity to find out what they were doing that was contrary to nature and correct it. And you know what they did? Nothing. They just continued it. People placed money ahead of either the humane treatment of animals or the safety of the food consuming population. And so now we're closing in on December the 21st, 2012. You only have three years. I mean, in this whole damn world is sound asleep. Okay. And when you and when you go and, and when you go and you brutalize animals like this, you brutalize them, you're not gonna get away with it. It's gonna come back. 
And you know, I hear people minimizing the situation. Well, you know, we don't want to upset everybody. We don't want them to stop eating pork chops and all. Just like in the Noah story, and that's what the Bible said. They they didn't pay a damn bit of attention to Noah until the storm coming and they were all floating out with them. Joan and I recently complained to the shop right about the way they pile up lobsters on top of one another. It's not only inhumane for these creatures, and they are creatures, but who, what, what is the condition of, of the people who are going to eat the one on the bottom? And they don't care. See, it doesn't make any difference, but now they don't have any choice because they've got three years to go. And this is just the beginning, this flu thing, just the beginning. And who knows what strains of disease develop within these, these, these things. But money is what matters, and nothing else. And Paca Votan said that would be our undoing. A total loss of our interdependence on nature. And nobody will be able to dis, uh, escape the retribution that comes down upon humankind because of what the merchants of greed have done. So that's the target, December the 21st, 2012. And you don't want to stand too close to it. But here's the key. The key is knowing who you are and what you are and how you operate. And I'll give you an idea what I'm talking about. You have to be aware of the difference between illusion and reality. Okay? What seems to be happening is an illusion. This is the wildest thing that you've ever heard in your life. This is the strangest thing that you've ever heard in your life. Nobody has ever told you this before. But there's no reason now that you don't know because the scientists exchange information. Well, they used to just talk to one another. Now they go on the internet and talk to one another. So. Now, once you get to understand that what you are experiencing is an illusion, then you'll be able to take a giant step towards the movement beyond the restraints of three dimensions. Does anybody here have anyone, a family member, or somebody that you love who physically died? Anybody here that would, would like to see that person or talk to that person? Do you know you can? And do you know that person, when you meet them, will look the same but different because you know why? It's not a physical thing out here. It's a photon thing here. And you'll recognize them in the same way that you recognize them when you're sleeping and you recognize people or you recognize things because it's nothing out here. It's here. It's all photons. You have to understand how it works. There is no re the only reason that the people who have left this earth and physically died, and the only reason you have not talked with them, you have not been in touch with them, is because of damned religion, who have frightened people about themselves, because they conjured up all this stuff from the dark ages of Europe when they used to go around slitting people's throats who dared to even think. The person that you loved who has physically died and moved on is photon in the same way that you are a photon. You have a body, as far as you know, they may not have a body. So you can't communicate with them body to body, but you communicate with them photon to photon in your room. In the upper room, in the back, is where you communicate. I want to show you. I've shown you this a hundred times. I want to show you a picture of you, and I want to show you a picture of your loved one or your friend, whoever it is, who has left this physical plane. Okay? Here you are. That's a picture of you and a picture of the person who died. You're both the same. This is you inside of a body. That's them outside of a body. Same thing. Same people. Same ideas, same concepts, same memories. And you know what the first thing they're going to say to you? I can tell you it's right. 
You know what they're going to say to you? How come it took you so long? Where the hell have you been? Well, and, uh, you know, we were afraid to do it. Jeez. But, you know, it's not something. You see what, what you've done here? You know, if you put your arm in a sling and leave it in a sling for a long time, you'll be able to use it. You know what you've done? You put your head in a sling. Your head is in a sling. It's a bunch of mush. And you've got to start exercising it. You don't want to see them? You don't want to see your mother? You don't want to see your father? You don't want to see your grandpa? You don't want to see them? Nah, hell with it. Don't do it. But if you want to see them, and if you're willing to enter into this realm of photon, then do it. Start to exercise it. Start to work on it. Most people in this world follow religious traditions that come out of the dark ages. It's like this guy that I was showing you. that He had no clue what the Bible said. And yet he was spouting off about it. And the second reason why we have no communication with any of these people is because we have adopted the equally ignorant religious obsession with the physical body. Now, did you ever notice something? Whenever you look on the internet and, and they're talking about how your body works, I mean, how do you see? Yeah. Do you ever notice that you're not seeing anything under your chair? How come? Because the cameras are up here. You have to put the camera under the chair to see. So how do you see? But they, they, you know what? This is what I got to kick at whenever I read this stuff. They always talk about you, but look at this. The human visual system is tricky. There are two components, the eye, which is the easy part to understand, and our perception of our eye signals as processed by our brains, which is the hard part. Our eyes are relatively easy to understand, and I'll explain a little here, as it relates to photography. Now, I want you to look at this line. Are you ready for this? We only see after our brains interpret what's sent to them from our eyes. Here's the question. Who are we? Who is we? Does that interest you at all? Who are we? This is saying we only see. Well, the first thing I say who is we? <laughs> and no matter what you pick up, no matter what you read, it's going to say the same thing. We're only all this. Right? Who's we? Okay. Now, the big question here is, we can only see after our brains interpret what's sent to them, so the brain sends the signal to who? We. <laughs> but who are we? Now, then I'm going to give you two choices as to who we are. Two choices. Here is what could be we. It could be this. I hate to shock you, but that's what you are. If you were out in the forest and there were lions there, they would consider you a filet mignon. <laughs> now, there's another part of you. After they get done with the filet mignon, they know all on this stuff here. <laughs> now, is that we? Are the messages coming out, going in, coming to, is this, are these the ones that are going to make the decisions? Or, on the other hand, is this we? <laughs> so you're either the meat on bone on the left, and if you are, forget it, or you're the photon on the right. And if you're going to say, this is what we are, then you're saying to me, there's intelligence in your pork chops, <laughs> or your human chops, or there's intelligence in your bones. Is meat and bone intelligent, or is photon intelligent? Let me show you something. There's a guy named Gary Zukov who wrote a very interesting book that a lot of you should uh, 
if you want. I'm not going to sell anybody's books, but it, it's, it's pretty easy to understand. He's a pretty decent guy. Uh, he wrote a book called, and this is a copy of it, he wrote a book called The Dancing Woolly Masters by Gary Zirkeloff. Now, he's talking about photons, all right? And when he's talking about photons, he says something that I want to share with you, okay? Okay. But what is happening everywhere, blah, blah, blah. There is no definitive answer. Some physicists like H. Walker speculate that photons may be conscious. Now, photons are you, okay? Consciousness may be associated with all quantum mechanical processes, since everything that occurs is ultimately the result of one or more quantum mechanical events. The universe is inhabited by an almost unlimited number of discrete, conscious, usually non-thinking entities that are responsible for the detailed working of the universe. Whether Walker's correct or not, it appears. Now, here's where we go. If there really are photons, and the photoelectric effect proves that there are, then it also appears that the photons in the double slit experiment somehow know whether or not both slits are open and that they are to act accordingly. Next one. This brings us back to where we started. Something is organic if it has the ability to process information and to act accordingly. We have little choice but to acknowledge that photons, which are energy, appear to process information and to act accordingly, and that therefore, strange as it may sound, they seem to be organic. Since we are also organic, there is a possibility that by studying photons, we may learn something about us. So the determination of the experiment is that the photon has the ability to process information, which means that when the information is coming back through the wires to the back of your head, it is communicating to photon, not your blood and your meat and bones and all of that stuff. Now, what does that word organic mean? Let's, let's define it. Organic means having properties associated with living organisms, resembling a living organism, an organization, or development interconnected. OK, so that would seem to answer the question as where the signal from the eye is going to be read. By, don't you want look at, look, look at me for a don't, don't you, don't you want to, I mean, where the heck, how does this work? I got it. Don't you care? How, it, how does it work? How do you see this stuff? You know what I mean? So if you're finally prepared to understand your true nature as photon and realize that even people that we think are dead are photon, then you're ready to step with me beyond the green door into the realm of the living. And I'll take you there. There may be some of you who would rather leave and go to church. That's your problem. So then let us uncover the secret of the ages by coming to grips with ourselves. Let's continue with your eyes for just a minute. We're almost done here, so it's not going to take you a few minutes more. How do your eyes pick up signals? What do they do with it? There are two things you got to remember. Illusion and reality. Now let me give you a perfect example of illusion involving you. Okay? John? Now, you see this? You see the plants are green and the flowers are blue. And they're very pretty. And you see stuff like that all the time. Now, when you go into the, when you go into the garden, you see that, right? No, you know, you're going too fast. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. When, you, when, when, you, when you go into the garden, you see stuff like that all the time. Okay? And it's beautiful. And you stand there, oh, look at the colors of the gladiolas. The calla lilies are in bloom. Peter, look at their blue. I'm going to show you the real color of these things. Now you can go, John. Here's it. There they are. That's what they really look like. So now, would you rather continue to live in your illusion, 
or uh, do you rather live in the real world? Now, I'm going to put the pictures up together again, but I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Peter Goros. Dr. Peter Goros. Let's introduce him to you first, because, I mean, I can't make this stuff up. You know what I'm saying? Because Dr. Peter Goros, he's a smiling guy, he says, was born in Brooklyn. He received an MD degree from John Hopkins University of Medicine, proceeded directly into a career in eye research at the National Institute of Health as part of the Public Health Service, at first Neurological Institute and Division of Blindness, and later in the National Eye Institute. He is renowned in three areas of vision research, all of which he has been a pioneer and leader. How many of you feel that he would be a credible witness? Okay. Okay, he's a credible witness. So, a doctor, would uh, you please step up and tell us what you have on your mind? There's our pictures, and this is what he says. Color vision is an illusion created by the interactions of billions of neurons in our brain. There is no color in the external world that is created by neural programs and projected onto the outer world that we see. Is that amazing? And how many hours did you pick, spend picking out your blouse? Because you love the color. <laughs> and now you find out that. Folks, I'm not teasing you here. I'm not kidding you. you. You saw the man's credentials, and this is a fact. Look at what he said. There is no color in the external world. It is all created in here. It's an illusion. Your brain does that all. So there is the illusion over here, the beautiful colors, and there is the reality over there. See, inside of your head is where the color is created by billions of brain neurons, and then you project it outward because what's happened is the light is measured by the brain and the wavelengths and the spinning and all of that stuff, and that winds up being the color that is given to you and me and everybody else. See what he says. Color is created by utilizing two properties of light, energy, and frequency of vibration or wavelength. How our brain separates these two properties of light, energy, and wavelength and then recombines them into color perception is a mystery that has intrigued scientists throughout the ages. In other words, you know, how does this work? All right. Color should be explained at the level of single cells in our brain. Although still beyond reach, progress is being made in deciphering these clever circuits that create our perception of the external world. I want you to read that again. S progress is being made in deciphering these clever circuits that create our perception of the external world. Outside of your head, it is all black and white. And the inside where the deciphering goes on is what creates this illusion or the perception of what you think you're seeing. So there are electrical circuits in the brain that reads wavelengths, two properties of light deciphered in the circuit to create color pictures. But who's supposed to look at them? Is all of this work going on inside of you, deciphering light fragments so it can go back to a pork chop or a piece of bone? What is that? And I'm just going to speak a second, because I'm done, we're done, we're gone. And I told you this before. And this is how we started this. I am not standing here. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> no, I am not. I am standing in your head back here. See? All that is coming to you are reflections of light which then are absorbed. You know what's coming into you from me, 
photons. And the photons come in, and then they become deciphered. Actually, if you could see me, not only am I black and white, but I'm standing on my head. Because you initially see with the lens, I am upside down. And as the signal goes back, it switches it right side up, and then it all gets back to where the color is constructed, and it winds up in your control room, and photon sees it. Touch that back there, because that's where it is. So now listen to me a minute. And, 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 and this is really going to get good. This is really going to get good. Remember I told you about William Crooks? And William Crooks made a woman come back from the dead, Katie King. And he was the most renowned scientist of the 19th century. And he took pictures of her and standing there and all this kind of stuff. And William Crooks was asked, are you saying it's possible for a woman to get out of the grave and come back from the dead and stand right here next? He said, I didn't say it was possible. I said it happened. But you see, here's the deal. People think they are seeing Katie King out there. But actually, Photon is materializing Katie King in here. When you see people you're going to see who have died soon, you're going to think they're out here. They're in here, which means there's no problem with this at all. For when you exercise this, when you exercise this in the pineal and all that business, you're going to start to find that it's going to get easier and easier and easier. And it's all going to happen here. Remember, you don't see anything out there. Everything is back in your control room back there. Signals. So seeing thousands who have passed on becomes very simple because they don't have to come to us physically. No one does. They simply have to appear back here in the control room and the illusion is created that you think there is someone there. You don't even know if there's anything out there because even when you touch things, it's just electrical energy sending signals back to the little room, the little control room. Everything is made up of electrical photon impulses in here. Lots more to come, and uh, if you dare, <laughs> we will take a walk. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hidden Meanings Conference Center at the Village Green Chapel.